I was raised primarily in North America, but I was actually born in Tokyo, Japan. I ended up marrying a woman from Japan, and so I'm back on a fairly regular basis. And when I'm back, I sometimes wonder to myself, what would my life have been like if we hadn't moved away from Japan when I was so young? What would life have been like for me if I had not only been born there, but raised there as well? And I think of all the pressure I would have been under to get admitted into the right preschool. And then all the pressure I would have been under to pass the exam to get into the right kindergarten. And then the pressure to get into the right college and to be picked up by the right company and so forth. And so I breathe this sigh of relief as I think, thank God I wasn't raised in such a relentless rat race. But if I'm honest with myself, having been raised here in North America, I haven't escaped the pressure to achieve. When I was younger, I felt the pressure to achieve in sports. And then I felt the pressure to achieve in school. And then I felt the pressure to achieve in the corporate world. And then when I entered into so-called vocational Christian ministry, I even felt the pressure to achieve as a pastor. Now, ambition is a good thing. But when we feel pressure to deliver, whether we're a student or at work or in a relationship, then life can begin to feel like a burden. And if you've ever felt a sense of heaviness that comes from feeling like you need to do something to somehow prove to yourself or someone else that you are enough, then Jesus has some very good news for you. He says to you and to me these words of invitation from Matthew 11. He says, come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray. Living God, through your Holy Spirit, we pray that you would take Jesus' words and land them into our spirit, helping us to respond to this gift of an invitation so that we might wear the yoke that you have perfectly designed for us so that we might live light and free. In Jesus' name, amen. So today I want us to look at how we can pursue a life of real contribution and healthy achievement, but not out of an anxious need to somehow prove to ourselves or someone important to us that we are enough, but out of a deep sense of inner peace and rest that comes from knowing that we are already accepted by the one who matters most. Jesus, in our scripture passage today, invites us by saying, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. How so? Jesus says, I will give you rest, or literally, I will rest you by placing my yoke upon you. Now, when Jesus uses the word yoke, I hope this is obvious enough, but Jesus is not referring to a yellow egg yoke. That would be sort of messy. Jesus in using the word yoke is referring to a wooden bar that is placed across the back of the neck of an ox, enabling it to more easily pull a heavy load. And so here, Jesus is comparing you and me to an ox. It's not very complimentary, it's not very flattering. If you're an American, you would probably prefer to be referred to as a soaring eagle. If you're a Canadian, do, do you know what our national animal is? Is, is it Michelle? Is, is, you're from Vancouver, right? So other than Michelle from Vancouver, does anyone else know what our national animal is? Or Helen or Wes that are visiting from our church? Moose? Moose is the number one most popular answer outside of Canada itself. Not the polar bear either. I'll, I'll give it away here. Our national animal is the beaver. 
It's on our money, as uh, Michelle pointed out. Not as cool as a soaring eagle, but beavers work pretty hard, they're industrious, and they make decent dams. So you learned something here today at One Love. But Jesus does not compare us to a soaring eagle, nor to an industrious beaver, but to an ox. It's not very flattering, but it is appropriate because like an ox, you and I tend to be weighted down by all kinds of burdens and concerns. When Jesus' first hearers heard these words of invitation, they would have felt weighted down by things like, will I have enough money to feed my family as they were living day to day in a farming-based subsistence economy? Those who were parents would have been concerned about the well-being of their children in a first century world where most newborns did not live to see the age of 20. And today you and I can feel burdened by financial concerns. We can also feel the heavy weight of the well-being of loved ones who may not be doing so well. But you and I feel a burden that people in Jesus' day did not feel as heavily. You and I can be concerned about whether we are accomplishing enough, about whether we are enough. And this burden would not have been felt as heavily by people in Jesus' day because their station in life there in the first century was largely determined by the family they were born into and their social circumstances. We now live in a world, whether it's in Hawaii or somewhere else, where we can move up. We can move up in our education. We can move up in our work life. We can move up in our social standing. But what if in this world where we can move up, we don't become really successful? What if we don't become the people that we projected we would one day become? Or what if we don't become the person someone else hoped we would one day become? then we can feel like a failure. We can feel like a loser. And so when Jesus says, come to me all you who are weary and burdened, he's also inviting those of us who have felt the burden to do something to somehow show to ourselves or to other people that we are enough. And Jesus says, if you want to rest deeply in your soul, then place my yoke upon your shoulders. Now, some of you are saying, but in order for me to rest, I don't need a yoke on my shoulders. I need to spend some time swinging in a hammock or chilling out at the spa or vacationing somewhere. I don't know exactly. You don't really need to go anywhere, in my opinion, for a vacation because you're in vacation land to begin with. But maybe you feel like you need a longer vacation, longer than just, say, Thanksgiving or Christmas even. But Jesus says, no, if you want to rest deeply in your body and in your soul, wear my yoke. Why? Because Jesus knows that the yokes that we're wearing don't fit us very well, that they chafe against the back of our neck. And some of the heaviest yokes of all are the yokes of other people's expectation, and maybe the heaviest yoke of all is the yoke of our own self-expectation. And you and I can get trapped into if-then kind of thinking. We can think, if only I, maybe when we were younger, if only I can get accepted into a certain school or a program, then I'll feel better about myself. Or we may think, if only I can be hired by a right company or organization, then I'll feel better about myself. Or if I can only, miracle of miracles, buy a house here in Hawaii, I'll finally feel all grown up. But Sean Acor, a psychologist who has taught at Harvard, points out that this if-then kind of thinking cannot be supported by science. Because every time we achieve a goal, our brain moves the goalpost as to what success looks like. So we get admitted into a certain school. Goalpost moves. Now we need to get good grades. We get hired by a certain company. The goalpost moves for us. Now the goal is, I need to stand out in that company. We're finally able to 
afford a down payment on a house here in Hawaii. Goalpost moves. Now we want a bigger house or a house in a better neighborhood. Our sense of being enough is not something that we achieve. It's something that we receive. Have any of you seen the movie Cool Runnings? So with some folks over here and some folks over here. See that hand back there? Cool Runnings is a movie that is loosely based on the true life story of Jamaica attempting to field their first ever bobsledding team at the Calgary Winter Olympic Games in 1988. There's a scene in the movie where the coach who's won two gold medals walks into a room and he sees that his star bobsledder Darius is carefully studying the bobsled course. And Darius feels the weight of the world on his shoulders because he believes that if he can only win a gold medal at these Olympic Games, people will finally respect him and see him as successful. Coach looks at Darius and sees all the pressure he's under. Coach looks at Darius and says, winning a gold medal is a wonderful thing. But if you're not enough without the gold medal, you won't be enough with it. And if we're not enough without the gold medal or whatever the gold medal represents for us, we won't be enough with it. I wanted to test this assumption and so I circled around to the only two-time Olympic gold medalist that I'm acquainted with. He's not a Canadian, he's an American. He's one of your, your fellow country folk <laughs> from Oregon. His name is Ashton Eaton. He won a gold medal at the London Olympic Games in the decathlon, repeated four years later as the gold medalist in the decathlon at Rio. And I asked him after the Rio Games, Ashton, have you seen the movie Cool Runnings? He said, oh yeah. Remember the scene where the coach says to Darius, if you're not enough without the gold medal, you won't be enough with it. Yeah, what do you think of that? And Ashton, without any hesitation, said, the coach is exactly right. When I won my gold medal, in London, the first one, I looked down at it and I thought, wow, this is nice. But after a little while, I thought, hmm, it's just a medallion. Just a medallion, just a piece of metal. It's not enough to make me enough. If you're not enough without the gold medal, whatever the gold medal represents for you, you won't be enough with it. Whether you're young, like a little baby, it's a good message to hear, or older. Jesus says that my love for you is a gift and our sense of being enough is not something that we achieve, it's something that we receive. It's not something that we create for ourselves, it's something that is conferred upon us by another. And Jesus says, if you're tired and weary in any way, come to me and I will place my yoke upon your shoulders. Now, what is Jesus' yoke? He describes it in verses 29 and 30, but not with much detail. If a word isn't clear in a Bible verse, one of the best ways to figure out what it means is by looking at the larger context of the passage. And if you scroll back four or five verses, you see that Jesus is celebrating the wonder of his perfect father's love for him. Jesus says, I praise you for the Lord of heaven and earth because you have revealed your truth, not so much to the best and the brightest, but to children and to those who approach you with the humility of a child. So Jesus here is just celebrating the wonder of his father's love for him. According to New Testament scholar Daryl Johnson, the yoke that Jesus wants you to wear is the yoke that he himself wore. And the yoke that Jesus himself wore is the yoke of his perfect father's unique love for him. And when he says, wear my yoke, he is saying, I want you, Anna, or you, you, to wear the yoke of my perfect father's unique love for you. And this sounds really simple, I know, but if you wear this yoke of the father's unique love for you, which is perfectly fitted for you, it will change the way you move through the world. 
Let me illustrate from a personal story. Some years back when I was single, I was visiting Japan, talking to a friend on a kind of little private island about a problem that he was facing. It was a very honest conversation. And partway through the conversation, this, this friend mentioned his college friend, Sakiko. And at that point, I was very honest and I said, you know, I've always liked her. I've always like liked her. And my friend said, well, she's still single and beautiful. You should call her. I'm like, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not here to socialize. He said, you should call her. She asks about you. She had such a good impression of you. She remembers you. And I'm like, no, no, I'm not here to socialize. He pulls out his phone and he, he, he calls her up. Phone is ringing. I'm like, I have, I have no idea what to say. I don't know what to say. But she answers and I'm like, hi, hi, uh, this, is, this is Ken. And she says, um, are you the guy who went to Berkeley? I say, no, 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 that was Jeff. <laughs> she had no remembrance of me whatsoever. <laughs> I asked her, um, by chance, would you like to go out for coffee with me on Wednesday? She says, no, 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 I, I, I'm, I'm busy. I don't know what came over me, but then I said, I don't know what your plans are, but can you change them? <laughs> now, I wasn't thinking about this in the moment, but later I thought, in Japanese society, it's very hard for a person to say no, especially twice in a row. So all the cultural traditions and norms were working in my favor. <laughs> Romans 8, 28. So I'm glad that you're in my corner over here. So she reluctantly went out with me for coffee. It didn't go very well. But we did get married. <laughs> Not right away. She was here last night, as Derek knows. But that's not the point of the story. You know, you wouldn't know this about me, but since we're just, most of us are meeting for the first time right now, but I am terrified of rejection, especially in the context of romantic pursuit. So I look back and I wonder, how was it that I was able to put myself out for possible rejection and heartache like that? I think part of the answer to that question is that I was slowly learning to wear the yoke of the Father's love across my shoulders. And when you know that you are loved by the one who matters most, even if you're naturally afraid of rejection, you tend to be willing to take more risks, to put yourself out, whether in a relationship or some other venture. And it's not that rejection or failure won't hurt, but if you know that you are deeply loved by the one who matters most, you become more resilient. You become more buoyant. You become a little bolder. You become a little freer as you move through life. So knowing that you wear the yoke of the Father's love on your shoulders really does change the way you move through the world. As Derek mentioned, I've written a book recently called Survival Guide for the Soul, How to Flourish Spiritually in a World that Pressures Us to Achieve. And in this book, I talk about some of the habits, the survival habits of the soul that enable us to live loved by our perfect Father in heaven. So one of the survival habits that I, that I write about is prayerful meditation. I'm a very easily distracted kind of person. So when I leave our house, the door, uh, at about 10 seconds after that, 15 seconds after, I typically come back in the house and say, I forgot my keys or I forgot my wallet or whatever. I'm very easily distracted. At any given time, I can feel like there are 127 monkeys jumping around in my head. And so at some point in the morning, I'll simply take some time to sit and breathe deeply. Breathing in through my nose deeply. Breathing out slowly. Breathing in through my nose slowly. Breathing out. And then I'll start to wonder, how much time has gone by anyway? <laughs> so I'll reach for my phone, not to check my messages, but to open up a free app, and I prefer the free apps, <laughs> called Centering Prayer. It has a timer, so I might set the timer to 10 or 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes. So I'm not thinking about the time. Continue to breathe deeply. 
chime sounds as though a country church bell were inviting me to pray. Continue to breathe deeply in through my nose and exhale slowly. Inhale deeply. Exhale slowly. And then I start to think of all the things I ought to be doing, my to-do list. And so I'll reach for my Bible or maybe just for a passage that I'm familiar with. And every time my mind wanders, I'll repeat the passage of scripture as a kind of affirmation. Be still and know that I am God. Distracted. Recite the scripture. Be still and know that I am God. Let me change the scene just for a moment. I'm from Vancouver, which as you may know, is a city close to the ocean, so I live not that far from the ocean. I love being on the water, kayaking or sailing on a friend's boat. Our waters are not nearly as warm as yours, so I especially love being here close to your warm waters. But there have been times when I've been out at sea in Vancouver and I've seen salmon jumping out of the water at a 45 degree angle. There have been times when I've been out at sea and I've seen pods of dolphins or whales in the distance. And there have been times when I'm just sitting, breathing deeply in God's presence. And I feel surrounded by the beautiful mystery that upholds the whole world and me. But there have also been times when I've been out in the water and I've seen a styrofoam cup bobbing up and down. Or I've seen an empty Coke bottle. Or some oil on the surface of the water. And there have been times when I've been sitting, breathing deeply, and I feel anxiety rising up in my heart. Or a feeling of envy towards someone. Or a painful memory. Or a feeling of anger. And as I'm sitting, breathing deeply in God's presence, I just lift them up to God in prayer. And I feel free of them. I feel lighter. And so prayerful meditation is very powerful for me. When the 15 or 20 minutes are done, chime sounds, I open my eyes, and I usually feel just a bit more relaxed, and throughout the day, just a little bit more focused, and aware of the presence of Jesus, and the love of God in my life. Prayerful meditation is a powerful way for me to wear the yoke of the Father's love on my shoulders. And by the way, you don't need to be religious or Christian even to practice this kind of taking time for silence. My cousin is not a Christian. He got a copy of Survival Guide for the Soul. He struggles with anxiety. He says, I meditate for five minutes in the morning and I feel more peace throughout the morning hours. Okay. Here's another survival habit of the soul that I practice. It's called a prayer of gratitude. Again, I use another free app. See a pattern here? Prefer the free ones. I understand the One Love app is free. It's called Reimagining the Examine. Plays a little bit of music, or maybe just the sound of water reminding me of the rain of Vancouver, or a creek. And it invites me to look back over the last 24 hours and to think about three things, two or three things that I am truly thankful for. So I can do this right now on the spot because I'm in Hawaii and there's lots to be thankful for. So I'm really thankful that yesterday, early in the morning, I went swimming, sort of snorkeling in Hanauma Bay. You probably know this, right? But if you get there before 7 a.m., it's free. Did you know that? You know, you're nodding your head, right? So it's a good deal if you're an early riser. Uh, yesterday, I also, uh, our 11-year-old son caught some Amama crabs. You know what Amama crabs are? With a net, just sort of catch and release. That was a good time. We had some pokey for for lunch. We don't have that in Vancouver. So it was really good. People afterwards were recommending different pokey places to me. And then I'm just really happy to be with you all. I love this church, love this community. So to be with you all, it feels like a great gift. 
Now this may seem like a very simple, ridiculously simple exercise, but the data coming out of places like Harvard show that if you will pause for maybe three or four minutes in your day and to give thanks for two or three things that felt like gifts and just sort of pause and savor them, it will change the way you move through the world. Have you ever been in the market for a new car or a car that was new for you? What happened? My, my colleague Edlin was recently in the market for an Austin Mini Cooper. You have those here, those little British cars. So she's thinking about buying one and everywhere in Vancouver she began to see them. It wasn't like the car dealership thought, oh, you're on the fence. I'm going to flood your neighborhood with these cars so that you, you know, go over the edge. Because she was thinking about buying one, she started noticing them everywhere. And if you will pause to give thanks to God for two or three things across your day, it will start to seem like more good things are coming into your life, even though that may not objectively be true. And as you associate those good things with God's love for you, you wear more of the yoke of the Father's love across your shoulders. Another survival habit of the soul and the last one, insofar as this message is concerned, is Sabbath. Sabbath rest. Part of the reason God gave us the gift of Sabbath is so that our identities would not be formed primarily by making bricks for Pharaoh in a manner of speaking through our labors, as important as they may be, but that our primary identity would flow out of the fact, out of the glorious fact that we are beloved daughters and sons of a living God who cherishes us. Our son Joey was at our service last night. He's 11 years old. He's not very productive. <laughs> Loves to play with his toys, does not love to clean up his room, nor did I when I was his age. He makes no money for our household economy, <laughs> but he loves money. So at his 10th birthday party, he opens up a card from a classmate of his and out floats out a cash bill and he looks at his classmate and says, thank you. I love cash. <laughs> Loves cash but doesn't make any. And then a few years ago, Joey was being kicked out of class or sent out of class with some other rowdy boys from time to time. He's doing better in school now. But we don't love our son Joey because he's productive or because he earns money for our household or because he's doing well at school or not so much. We love him because he's breathing, because he has a pulse, because he is alive, because he exists. And when we pause and take time for Sabbath, we are reminded that we have value, not because of what we do or because we're successful, but for the simple glorious fact that we're breathing, that we're alive, that we are his, that we are a much loved daughter or son of God. So in this book, I write about eight survival habits of the soul. I've just talked about three right now. And as Derek mentioned, I wrote this book recently and we have some copies available afterwards in the coffee shop area by the doors. We're able to offer the book at our friends and family discount and your family uh, about half the price, half the retail price. 100% of all the proceeds from book sales go to World Vision and to missions that work with vulnerable children. I don't earn a penny from any book sale. And from my first book, which some of you have read, we were able to give away $300,000 to missions that work with children that are vulnerable. This book, Open, is a number one bestseller. And so, uh, thankfully, we'll be able to give $100,000 or $200,000 from, from this book uh, in the not too distant future. I also want to say this that it looks like, uh, according to Derek, we're gonna sell out of the book. If we sell out, you can put your name down and, and, uh, for a pre-order and we will ship them to you at the same discounted rate for you and your friends and family, okay? So you can just put your name down if we sell out, we likely will. I also wanna say this, and this is important. If you're here and you can't afford the discounted price, it's just 10 bucks, I would be honored to gift you with a copy. I've got a credit card here, so I can put it on my credit card. It works here in America, even though it's a Canadian card. I can pre-order for you. <laughs> and when I first became a pastor, I was making $200 a month. So it, that was a long, long time ago. But even with inflation adjustment, it wasn't a lot of money. And so I could not afford to buy books. And so on my day off, I would go to Barnes and Nobles, 
I would pull a book off the shelf and just sit real small, <laughs> read, 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 fast, fast, fast. And then when I was done, I would put a piece of paper <laughs> in the book where I had finished reading, put the book back on the shelf, and I would pray, God, don't let anyone buy the book. <laughs> I would come back seven days later and continue reading. So if that's you, you just can't afford books, uh, I would be honored to buy you a copy. You know, someone uh, at the book table after the last service said, you know, I too struggle with a fear of rejection. So I really need to know that I am loved. I, 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 it would be helpful for me to go through life without the fear of failure and rejection. And if you're here and you would like to live that way, with the yoke of the Father's love across your shoulder, I would encourage you to pick up a coffee for yourself or a friend afterwards at the, at the book table in the coffee shop area. Let me close with this. When I was in my 20s making the transition from the corporate world to the world of so-called vocational pastoring ministry, I enrolled in something called the Arrow Leadership Program. And that was where I first met Waxer. There were about 25 of us who gathered and afterwards, Waxer said that we were all like fighter pilots in the movie Top Gun. We were sort of sizing each other up like rivals. And I would say that Waxer was like Tom Cruise, you know, the equivalent, you know? You can tell him I said that. You know, I think he might be watching online. And we were all eager to impress the founder of the program, Leighton Ford, a great Christian leader and the brother-in-law to the late Billy Graham. Wow, yeah, that's what I was thinking too, is Akleana. Yeah, wow, I'm glad that you're, you're tracking with the story here. And, and I was the youngest in the class, the least experienced in so-called Christian ministry, so I was desperate to impress the founder, Leighton Ford. One time in class, I raised my hand real high, and I was able to summarize an obscure book written by an MIT professor. I was trying really hard. But then as a young Christian leader, I, I stumbled and I fell. I got into a conflict with someone that I was working with because of my own emotional immaturity and self-centeredness. I was in a dating relationship with someone and we were struggling to maintain certain boundaries. And here is what I learned in my failure. That Leighton Ford's acceptance of me was not dependent on my performance. And it was not even dependent on my capacity to contribute something to his organization. I learned that Leighton Ford loved me, accepted me for no apparent reason, just because. Fast forward 20, 25 years later, we've become close friends. I feel more at home in my skin with Leighton Ford than ever before. I can cry in his presence. I can laugh with him. I can just be my total true self with him. And it's not that I no longer want to make something out of my life and ministry in part to honor his investment in me, but it no longer comes out of this desperate, anxious need to be accepted by him because I already am. It comes out of a deep place of gratitude and rest that comes from knowing that no matter what, I am loved by him. And this is what I want for you, my sisters and brothers here at One Love. Insofar as your life is concerned, insofar as God is concerned, I want you to go for it and I want you to offer your very best. But not out of an anxious need to prove to yourself or someone else or to God that, that you are enough but out of a deep sense of peace and gratitude that comes from knowing that you are already enough. In fact, you are cherished by the one who matters most. Hey, thank you for spending your time with us today at One Love Ministries and being a part of our program. But this invitation that you heard today through the Word of God is directly to you. And I want you to know if you have not yet made a profession of faith, meaning ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, that invitation is available to you right now. Change, transformation, all the glorious things that God wants to do are available to you, but you gotta ask. You must personally invite Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. So if God has been speaking to you during this message, your heart's been beating, your hands been cutting kind of sweaty, you've been wrestling with things, guess what? That's the Lord knocking on your heart. And I wanna lead you right now in a prayer that can allow you to invite Jesus Christ to become your Lord and Savior and open the door for eternity for you and him to be together. I want you to pray with me right now. It's not a magic prayer, but an honest heart that will invite the Lord into your life. Join me right now. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I ask you to forgive me and to become my Lord 
and Savior. Today, Jesus, I believe that you are God and that you saved me, and my faith will be put in you. Please give me your Holy Spirit to come in and upon me, that I might learn how to live as a child of God. Thank you, Jesus, for your love, and today I come home. In your name I pray, amen. If you prayed that prayer with us, we are excited. The Bible says the angels in heaven are rejoicing and we want to join them too. So would you call this number right here on the bottom of the screen and let us know. We want to help you find a church that's in your area. Get plugged in, get fellowship, get disciple as the Bible says because we want to grow in God's grace together. God bless you. He loves you. We're excited. If you would like to receive a copy of today's message, please write down the sermon number on your screen and give us a call at 955-9335. For service times and locations, check us out on the web at onelove.org. Mahalo for watching.